You! I was wondering what kept you. Where have you been? What are you doing here? The question is, what are you doing here? What do you mean? I live here. Wrong, dumbass. I live here. The fuck are you talking about? This is my home, dipshit. I fucking live here. Have you noticed anything strange? I don't think so. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. So, tell me this fuckface, when was the last time you were outside? Well, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's been a while. The door won't open, will it? How about the fucking ability to summon fire? How long have you been able to pull that out of your ass? Alright, I'll bite. What's going on? Well, sit down, fuckface, before I sit you down. Let me tell you just how fucked you are. This is my home. I've always lived as a subconscious part of your brain. I'm the angry part of you. So if you're here in my home, that means you are in your own subconsciousness. My theory is that after reviewing that sonnet you bullshit, your brain just said fuck it and shut down. Think back for a second. You woke up suddenly finding yourself in a place you don't even live. And you're unable to leave. I have, on the other hand, been busting my ass trying to get in. It was first when you decided to try your luck with some bullshit fire that your own imaginary power slowed down enough to allow me to get inside. After that I just watched you do your silly little thing with YouTube or whatever. I could just come forth, but if you would pass out from shock, there's a good chance we would both die. Are you with me so far? So, while you were doing your little thing on YouTube, I was uh, walking around here going Sigmund Freud trying to find a way to save your fucking bacon. Did you find one? Actually, yeah. You're locked in here because of guilt. What? Yeah, guilt. Apparently you're feeling guilty about something, and you won't exactly be able to leave until you have confronted this guilt. Well, why would I want to leave? I got everything that I want right here. Yeah, along with one bed. Tell me, dipshit, do you want to be the big spoon or the little spoon? I play a girl in most RPGs. It's not that... I don't like Lord of the Rings. It's not that... I think Star Wars is overrated. Enough with the movies. I enjoy My Little Pony. <laughs> really? <laughs> Gay. Remember Risa, friendship and tolerance. Look, fuckface, it's got nothing to do with that small shit. It's something bigger. Probably tied in with your reviewing or something, see, it only happened recently. Well, I'm open to suggestions. I know. A webcomic filled with your guilty pleasures. Like what? Like dating sims, uh, manga, anime, video games. Y you don't mean. Oh, but I do. I really, really do. I, I can't review that. That's why you have to. Because you know when you put this shit under your reviewing microscope, you'll find it crawling with shit that you don't like. I, I, I don't want to. Is that fair? How do you think the makers of these comics felt when you trash talked them? How about Axe Cup, Boston Heroes, or Pika Simichu? How the fuck do you think they felt when you trash talked the shit they liked? I guess you're right. Fine, fine, I'll review it. I'll review it. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs>
My very first review on YouTube was Bizarre Uprising because it was one of those webcomics that inspired me to become a webcomic artist myself. But there was a different comic that really made me say, alright, I want to make a webcomic. This was one of my favorite webcomics of all time and I loved Fred Gallagher's Art to Boot. Eventually I just stopped reading it and I didn't really know why. Until I read it again. The comic was originally made by Fred Gallagher and Rodney Caston, but Rodney decided to abandon the project back in July 2002. It has been a huge bipolar ride for not only readers but also reviewers of the series. Some are head over heels of this webcomic, while others hate it like it was the asshole that stole the last snack from the fridge. And suddenly you can't beat him because he was fed and he needed that candy bar. Fucking Jeff. I won't lie, I still have a lot of love for this series. It was one of those comics that dared to be different and had some okay good art. It wasn't necessarily funny, but was a nice drama story about two Americans caught in Japan trying to raise money to get home and the people they meet on this journey. So if it's got good art, great characters and an excellent premise, why haven't I sung this comic high praises yet? You can tell this is gonna hurt, can't you? The comic centers around the two main characters, Piro and Lago, who at the spur of the moment travel to Japan and the hilarity that ensues from this. At this point, the comic had a nice charm going for it. It was funny, the jokes were great and new, and sort of poked at the prejudice we here in the West have for Japan, such as beating people in Mortal Kombat to get a visa. Bitch, taking his words at you, I mean we got Snoop Dogg. Okay, so I suppose it's Snoop Lion. How the fuck can you say? Rasta for life and Bob Marley reincarnated when you spent most of your life rapping about busting a cap in someone's ass. Oh, write the review. Get ready for the next battle. I fade him. Ready. I fade him. I need death. Eventually, Piro and Lago spend up all their money and have to stay in Japan until they raise enough money for the trip back home. This was really interesting. It was an interesting dilemma to be put in, as well as a great opportunity to make a lot of great unique jokes that wouldn't work in any other comic. And it gets even better! BAM! Suddenly you have a romantic subplot when they meet Erika and Anasawa. And not only that, but then you had Ping, a robotic PS2 accessory that is meant for dating simulators, and Yuki, a girl who gets a crush on Piro after seeing his art. So let's recap. We got interesting characters, great basis for great jokes, and an interesting situation. And on top of all that, we got a Harlem love story? This whole thing is what dreams are made of, and they managed to balance the seriousness with the humor perfectly. <coughs> Until Rodney Caston left the project. I'll be perfectly honest here. This pains me to say, when Megatoggy was the webcomic that made me start doing what I did. I mean, shit, had it not been for this comic, you wouldn't even have the webcomic relief. So, to say this after loving this comic for so long and having it as a shiny unicorn I tried to catch when I made a strip for my own comics, this is painful. But oh god. If you can imagine you are balancing comedy, romance, seriousness, story, characters and of course jokes, this is what it looked like when Rodney was on the team. And this is what happened when Fred took over the whole thing. The majority of the comic's jokes were centered around either Piro and his girl troubles or Lago and his adventures. I don't think Rodney intended for these adventures to be taken serious. Stuff such as Lago releasing a horde of undead on Tokyo and that the police has a special cataclysm unit that takes care of major disasters on a regular basis. So of course you just laugh it off with, oh Lago, you're so silly. But then you are actually meant to take it serious. And at other times it's just comic relief again. This makes it almost impossible to comprehend whether you should go OH or OH. Prices offer tip number 10. Rule of thumb. Don't ever use the punchline as a story device. Most webcomics you will find out there are meant to entertain you and they usually do this by telling a story while at the same time ending every other page with a joke. These jokes should almost never influence the story. It makes it hard for the reader to differentiate between comedy and the actual story. 
You never saw scrubs where JD imagined a tiny midget smacking his balls. Later he's put in the hospital because of crushed testicles and you're meant to take that seriously. That's what Mega Tokyo suddenly gives us. But wait, there is more. Fred couldn't always reach his deadline with the comics. So he often throw out various sketches and other artwork to sort of give the reader something to look at as an excuse for not being able to finish the comic of the day. So you're scrolling past these going, oh, that looks nice. But then suddenly, bam, without any warning or anything, those pictures were actually meant to lead to something in the actual story. But fucking wait! Still more! Fred Gallagher should really run for president or something because I've yet to find a single guy who can talk so much without saying fucking anything. Tomes upon tomes of pages are filled with what should be creative dramatic dialogue with some deep alternative meaning, but really, it's all the same fucking thing. Blah blah blah, this game girl who says she's not real, she's talking about her fucking self! The comic does have some good scenes, don't get me wrong, but they are few and far between. It just amazes me how a great comic like this can fall flat so fast. Surely, it'll be better in the art department, right? I love the art. Remember what I've said in almost every review where I like the art? I love it when you can see someone's personal touch to a style, like Art of the Stick. It is so simple and easy to make, but I'm damn sure you won't be able to cover it simply because it has that touch that only the artist could make. The same thing goes for Mega Tokyo. It has its own flair and its own style. Besides, it's just all around pretty to look at. Fred Gallagher is a fully educated architect, which means he is no stranger to drawing, and it really shows. He doesn't hold back when he draws. If he needs to draw a lot of people, fuck you, he'll draw a lot of people. Fred don't give a shit, yo! There are different angles, background, actions and whatnot, and they all look really really good. The clothes are creative for the most part, the costumes and whatnot shows Fred's love for the Japanese pop culture and there are also some pretty awesome ways of simply putting it in the panels that sometimes help showing two completely different things. Like at one time where Fred manages to show there is total chaos behind the characters but the frame's position helps you focus on what they are talking about and not what's going on behind them. <sighs> but but but. Fred has a huge fucking flaw that forces me to dig deep down into the webcomic relief archive. But my god, it's so bad it even makes it hard to know what the fuck is going on. Anyway. The difference here however is that Fred's art isn't particularly bad. It's unfinished. Let's pretend for a second you don't know your left nut from your right elbow when it comes to drawing. There's a thing called inking. Inking is like saying, alright. This is how it should look. Let's confirm it. What you then do is tracing the lines you made with a pen, inking the lines. The reason you use ink is because then you can simply use your eraser and delete the pencil underneath the ink without any fear of the eraser fucking up the ink. This makes it look more clean and finished. Or you can do like me. Draw your sketches on a piece of paper and then ink them with your tablet. Now look at this. Fred doesn't always ink. It was interesting to begin with, but eventually it becomes clumsy to look at and eventually almost makes it impossible for you to figure out what the fuck is going on. Especially when Fred gets confident enough to fill up the pages with stuff that are equally badly inked. It makes it all melt together in a big pile of grey... meh. Of course you can simply just buy the books and get the inked version, but isn't that kind of cheap to leave the people who supported the project to begin with hanging? Just because they don't want to pay for something they can already read for free? Another thing Fred isn't particularly good at is drawing characters. When in profile, you have next to no chance of telling who's who unless the frame matches what happened prior to it. All the girls look the same and a lot of the males have almost the exact same face structure. Now, it works if you're going for what's called a B shonen style of drawing, but those things typically go hand in hand with a female body structure as well. Where's the chin? The cheekbone, the nose. No fucking wonder Piro plays a girl online. He looks like one in real life too. Which bring us to...
The characters are a nice different bunch. Everyone has their ups and downs. There are things they're good at and there are things they're bad at. It's said that the best characters are the ones that complement each other and these characters fit each other perfectly. I fucking... <coughs> really? Already? Rises of a tip number 11. Typically, one can say that the more serious the story is, the deeper the character needs to be. The reason for this is, say, having James Sunderland in My Little Pony. You're more or less expected to know everything about James to know what makes him tick, while everyone around him are rather basic characters. You can also flip it around and imagine Pinkie Pie in Silent Hill 2. It's kind of hard to take it all serious when she'll be bouncing off the walls about laughing when you're afraid. Fanfiction writers, on your marks, get set, go! Lago and Piro are both great characters to begin with, but Fred tries to expand their characters as the story gets more serious, which ends up changing them completely. One could argue it's personal development, but people change their behavior in accordance to experiences. In layman terms, it means shit needs to happen before they change, and here they don't experience anything that will cause the changes that happens. Think about it. Shit has happened that has made you to who you are today. You don't just one day wake up going, Maybe I should write cactus on the side of my cheek and then later get it tattooed there. First and foremost, I gotta mention the obvious thing here. Yes, Piro is a shameless self-insertion of Fred Gallagher. Given the age is different, but whenever Fred draws himself, he draws himself exactly as Piro. Maybe with some different glasses, but it's only a question about time before those are identical too. And is he in any way humble about this? Mm, no. Who's the one all the girls fall for? Piro. Who's the one who understands Nile Sour better than anyone else? Piro. Who's the guy who does all sorts of heroic things? Piro. Who's the main protagonist? Piro. Who falls in love but has no hidden agenda about getting into the girl's pants? Fucking Piro. Lago is a clear reader favorite, simply because he's so wacky. At first, he is the perfect addition to Piro's character. When Piro is too Japanese nerdy, Lago is there to point it out, and everywhere else, he's just wacky. But yeah, Fred fucks that up as well. Suddenly, even Lago becomes this angsty, serious character, and every now and then, Fred remembers he was supposed to be a four-year-old in a grown man's body, and bam, suddenly he's wacky for another page or two. It's like watching the Terminator walk around shooting shit with his shotgun and going Wow, I'm here to farm gold for California! Wow. For some reason, what Fred gets down the best are the women. They are strong, independent, but keeps their feminine sides. Also, he doesn't portray them in any suggestive ways in the comic. He keeps that for another side. And God help you if you try to draw it in any kind of not safe for work way. But, like with the two before mentioned characters, something ruins them. First of all, Erika is an idol who has gone underground in hope to escape the public eye. But at one point she is found out, and everyone after that recognizes her. Has no one seen Erika before that point? Which is unlikely seeing she has been off the radar for what seems like years. Nanasawa is Piro's love interest for reasons that is yet not properly explained. I don't know, I just really don't like her. She's this goody two shoes, but ends up being an outright bitch to Piro sometimes for no real reason. Also, her mood and the amount of how fragile she is changes up and down so much that you end up wondering who Nanasawa is and what she's supposed to be like. Either she's incredibly complicated or she's PMSing all over this bitch. Really, all the characters and what went wrong with them can be summed up with one character, Junpei. Junpei is a ninja who more or less takes care of people who are in Japan with a Mortal Kombat visa. You're not supposed to take him seriously, nor see him as someone who's that important to the plot. He was made because, hey, Japan had ninjas. But after Fred takes over, Junpei starts becoming too... real. Suddenly there's a story behind his mask. Suddenly he's kicked out of his clan, blah blah blah. Look, Junpei was meant as comic relief, not as a serious character. I know that, other readers know that, you know that, but Fred clearly did know that. And that sums up the characters. They were great in their simplicity. Heck, they were good even when they had a little death, 
But suddenly Fred just went apeshit and made it seem like an entire case study could be made on just one of them. There are a ton of other characters, but bringing them up will only make me repeat myself more than I already have. All the characters suffer from the same problem as the others. They change too fast and it escalates out where they lose their charm. It's the same with the story. At first it's cute and interesting, but starts evolving into more than it should be. Some things should just stay simple. Or in the case of Mega Tokyo, simple-ish. Yeah, Mega Tokyo is equivalent to throw a ball in the air. It starts off good, becomes really good, and then just plummets to the ground, every now and then bouncing back up before eventually those bounces become smaller and eventually non-existent. The premise is a 5. What we got here is an amazing premise, worthy of TV sitcom stuff, that eventually escalates out of control. Fred tried to make it into more than it could be, which turns a really good premise into a really bad shit. The art is a 7. I know people will comment that this is too high a score, but when push comes to shove, the art is pretty damn good. And it could be so much better if Fred would just use an hour or so more with inking the pages. But because it doesn't, we are left with art where we often find ourselves wondering just what is happening. The characters are a 4. At one point in the comic, Nanasawa says, You can put me on a lease, but do you think you'll be able to hold it? This is clearly the case with the characters. Fred couldn't hold it. The characters were great to begin with, but eventually escalated too much out of control. All in all, Mega Tokyo is a 5. It pains me to see that a comic I loved so much is now just meh. If Rodney was Tokyo, then Fred was Mega. And without the Tokyo, this is just Mega. Too much told too poorly. But it's definitely worth a read as long as you can endure it. There. I hope you're fucking happy yeah. until your ass is out of the well, Let's give it a go then. Well, go on then. Shoo! Shoo! Right. If you hurry up, I can still catch up on some Guild Wars too. Here's something I don't get though. Why from you webcomics? I mean, they're considered to be the lowest kind of literature. Why not real books or comics? That's where the real money is at. Weird guy. You wanna know? Because good stuff doesn't come from your wallet or your balls, it comes from your heart. Wow, ow. <coughs> okay, no bad left. <coughs>